Welcome to the new year again. Again. Happy New Year again. Amen. I know you know you say it fast like Sebok Mani Badzeo. I grew up thinking it was just Sebok Mani Badzeo. I hope that you are all blessed this year. I hope that you all had a blessed and safe holiday with your families, with your loved ones. I pray and I hope that this new year will be full of blessing, full of provision, full of grace for all of our Awake Ministries members, for all of their loved ones. Uh, long time no see. Right? <laughs> A uh, long time now. I'm a little nervous. I'm a little nervous. Uh, I missed all of you very much. Even though I was here last Sunday, we had a guest speaker, and so I haven't been able to speak here uh, for two full weeks, and it feels like such a long time. So I'm very eager to stand here once again. And while I was in India, our senior pastor was talking about how a pastor, when they preach, can be blessed even though they are the ones preaching, right? Unebado, right? They can be blessed even while they are preaching. Not because they hear their own sermon and think, wow, my sermon is amazing, but they're blessed by the people that they are preaching to. When they see the congregation, when they see how they are receiving the word, the preacher can be blessed. And the important thing is, not every church has this. Not every church has this. A church can have a very big building, a church can have a very large budget, they can have plenty of money, they can have lots of people sitting in the rows of the chairs, but that doesn't mean that they can bless the pastor. That's something special. And that's the difference between a church that just invites you, any church can invite a preacher, versus a church that welcomes a preacher. And the point of this was that he said, Myeongsung Church, it, this church reminded him of Myeongsung Church because Myeongsung Church is a welcoming church. Not just a church that invites pastors, but a church that welcomes pastors. And even today in our main Korean services, we have guest speakers all day today, but in each service from Yibu all the way through Obu, we are welcoming these pastors to come and speak and they can feel that welcoming spirit. And as he was describing all of this, I realized what a blessing it has been for me these past months in Awake Ministries, spending time with you, being able to deliver God's messages to you, how I have been blessed. And so I want to thank you, thank you once again for always blessing me every Sunday. It truly, truly is a blessing to me. And I know all of you are very eager. People have been asking me nonstop, you know, to tell them about India, about Calvary Temple, this church that we had visited. So I will tell you a little bit, but they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I've prepared about maybe a million words here. Uh, prepared a very short slideshow. So I want to show you some photos that we took while we were in India. If it will no. Yes. So, uh, if you can see, this is the main sanctuary of the church there. It's very bright. They like neon lights. Uh, when I went in, I thought, oh, this looks like an Indian wedding hall. But um, this is their main sanctuary. And that, that is a fireplace inside the, the pulpit there. They actually have three fireplaces. And... You can see there, this service was the Sunday evening service. And in that room, they had over 10,000 people. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's a lot of people. As I said, three fireplaces, right? Next slide. And they actually separate the congregants between men and women. There's a metal fence between them. So there's no crossing over. Uh, and this is actually a very unique thing that, that only they do. So they were very surprised when they heard that in Korean history, we also used to have churches separated between men and women. But the bottom picture you can see also is their overflow room, right? So when this main sanctuary gets full, they send people there. And that room also holds 10,000 people. And that room there is full also. You can go to the next slide. 
And so they were introducing our church. Uh, as you, these are very familiar pictures. Uh, this is our Abbada, right? This is Chusukamza uh, Drive, right? And this is uh, from the 2019 summer Tukse. Right, so 2019 March special early morning prayer rally, and they were introducing our church. And you know, I'm the one who sent them these pictures, right? But even though I was the one who sent them, and I had seen them before, seeing it there on the big screen and seeing how they reacted, I was just overcome with emotion because they were so inspired to hear about our church, to hear the good things that God is doing all the way here in Myeongmyo. Next slide. Um, so you can see here just pictures of how many people they are and here too they, they raise their arms as they pray. They're full of the Holy Spirit. Um, it was a little different than I was expecting. I was expecting, uh, you know, one of the most famous Indian preachers is a guy who likes to throw his jacket around and people go flying. But this church, um, from the very beginning, they decided that we're not going to do these kind of wild things, but it's going to be very orderly, and it's going to be Bible-based and full of prayer. So it felt almost like a Presbyterian church, uh, which was strange, but uh, you can see there that they're truly full of the Holy Spirit. Next slide. So they showed us the kitchen. And this is when I realized, when visitors come to our church, we should show them our kitchen. We should show them our shikdangu. Uh, and so they, they make food for all the people that come here in these huge pots. As you can see there, that pot uh, is several hundred kilos, right? And so they have to carry it with these long logs, like the Ark of the Covenant, right? They have these long rods to, to carry these hot pots around. And actually our senior pastor was about to try some of the food with his hands, and they stopped him. They said, no, you're going to make the food dirty. <laughs> so you're going to make the food dirty. You have to use a spoon. So we learned some good manners while we were in India. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so this is outside the church. So that's the main gate there. And if you can see there, that's not a dog. That's a goat. A goat. Uh, and so goat is not a, it's not a guard goat but this goat was this person's hunger. So they brought a goat for hunger, and uh, we might have eaten it later. We ate a lot of goats there. And on the bottom, you see the metal detector, because there's a lot of terrorist threat there, especially against Christians. They have metal detectors at every single entrance. And so thousands of people pass through these metal detectors to get into the church. And you can see, um, I don't know if you can see very well, but the line is going back there several kilometers actually, because these people are walking from the railroad station, which is a little bit farther away. So they travel a great distance and then walk and then wait to go through the metal detector. And somehow they do all of this. They, they bring 20, 30,000 people in. And then all those people leave. And then the next service comes in and they do it in 30 minutes. In 30 minutes. Right. So our church, we have uh, about an hour in between our service times, right, to get everyone in and get everyone out, but they do it in 30 minutes. It was truly amazing to see just this huge flow of people back and forth. If we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this was more pictures of the service, and that's me uh, introducing our senior pastor to one of our newest uh, AM members, Hana, uh, Hanaka who actually uh, received Christ, accepted Christ as her savior on December 23rd, 2019. So uh, when our senior pastor heard her story and her testimony, he was very uh, inspired. I, I just wanted to, to have them say hello and then have her leave, but he said, no, she has to stay for dinner. And we took her around and toured the church and everything. And uh, it truly was a blessing. And you can see there our senior pastor speaking with their senior pastor, Reverend Satish Kumar. And we thought that this was a Yongjokshir, a reception room, right? It's, this is actually his living room. It's attached to the, the main sanctuary, right? So from the living room, you go right out into the main sanctuary because 
he and his entire family lives inside the church. They actually physically live inside the church. Their entire house is there. Next slide. So this is the youth fest. We traveled from Hyderabad to Nambur. And so this is the youth fest. There's about 7,000 uh, young people here that are gathered to hear uh, sermons. And the youth fest ran from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it was just sermon, worship, sermon, worship, lunch, sermon, worship, sermon, worship. Uh, and so our senior pastor spoke at one of the sessions. And then afterwards, they did a joint Q&A. Uh, Reverend Satish Kumar and our senior pastor did a Q&A together. Next slide. So this is the night service. And this was for the third anniversary celebration of the Branch Church in Nambur. And... Um, the church is three years old now, the branch church is three years old, and they have over 10,000 members. Uh, so it's truly amazing to see what God is doing there. And it was a little difficult to get pictures because it was so dark, so we had to overexpose everything. But uh, you can see just how many people are gathered there. They estimated this was about 9,000 people. And uh, it truly was an amazing experience to... Uh, see the powerful ways that God is moving, to see how welcoming they were to, to us and how hungry they were for the Word of God. If you could go to the next slide. So this is our senior pastor and Reverend Satish Kumar in the sanctuary. This is after the service. Um, so after the last evening service at about 9.30 p.m., the senior pastor does a tour of the whole church and then he gathers all the pastors for Kumi. <laughs> So um, this was during that tour. Um, it's amazing to see it empty like this. So you see there's seats on the sides and then the middle is all just a uh, floor for people to sit. And they sit, you know, just shoulder to shoulder on the floor for three hours um, to hear the word of God. It was truly amazing. So that's the end of the slideshow. I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea, sort of a picture in your my, well, not a picture in your mind, you've seen the pictures, um, but to visualize uh, what we experienced there and the, truly the amazing things that God is doing. And, you know, to see what God is doing in another part of the world. A lot of times we start to think that where we are, where I am, my city, my town, my country is the center of the entire universe, the center of the world. Yeah, everything revolves around soul, right? Everything's in soul. What else is there? But to see what God is doing, to see that we live in just one small, small, tiny part of the world, a big, wide world that God has made, that God is in control of, that God is working. We have to remember that we do not own God. We do not own God. We do not have priority access to his grace. We do not have exclusive rights to his blessing. We are not the favorite children in the family. You know, parents say, I don't have a favorite child, but, but, you know, my, my first is, uh, but we are not God's favorite children. We are not. God loves all of his children. And it's important for us, it's very important for us to love our local church. I know all of you here love Myungsung Church. It's important. But we must also have a heart and an eye towards the greater church in this world, the worldwide body of Christ. So it was very encouraging to me to hear about the story of Calvary Temple, the story of Dr. Satish Kumar. Uh, to give you a brief overview, he planted this church just 15 years ago. 15 years ago, in 2005. Think about what you were doing in 2005. Think about what you were doing in 2005. Myungsung Church was already 25 years old. Our English service had been established for six years already at that point. In that short time, this church grew to twice the size of our church. They have now over 200,000 members. 200,000 members. And to be really, really honest with you, when I hear about other pastors nowadays, you know, recently, 
when I hear about them planning to plant a church, when they, they say they're going to go out and start a new church somewhere, you know, I sort of laugh. I think, really? You want to you wanna start a new church in 2020? Think about what you're doing. Because even among many pastors, we feel deep down inside that there's no more room for a new church. There's no more room for a, a new congregation to start and to grow. Why don't you just get a job? Get a job at a church somewhere, an established church, you know, serve there for a couple of years, and then you hope one day you get called to be a senior pastor somewhere else. That's the normal track for a pastor, right? Every career has a track that you have to follow. Just follow the track. What are you doing going planting a new church? Do the safe thing, do the obvious thing, do the thing that is already known, the way that has already been mapped out for you. There is no more space for a new church. And what that is saying is that there is no more room, there is no more space for God to move, no more room for God to act, to work. But what we know about God is that our God is a God who makes space. When there is no space, he makes space. When room cannot be found, he finds it. Our God is a God who works, who moves, who acts. In today's passage, our Bible reading today in Isaiah 43, Isaiah recalls a time when the Israelites faced a monumental problem, a big, big problem. They could not see a way forward. They could not see any room around them. There was no space for them to even breathe. As the saying goes, they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. They had nowhere to go. The mighty roaring waters of the Red Sea crashed into the shore in front of them. The rumbling of the Egyptian soldiers, their horses, their cavalry, chariots, roared behind them. The Israelites were not fighting people. They were not a band of fighting men fit and ready for battle. They were old, they were young, they had livestock, they had women, they had old, they had sick. Many of them were already exhausted. They were already dying from the journey through the wilderness. This was the last thing that they needed, was a battle. And they surely were not going to swim across the Red Sea. All that they had, the only thing that the Israelites had, was this crazy old man named Moses, with a stick in his hand. I don't know what it is with that stick, but he always carries it around. This crazy old man, Moses, who said that he was going to bring us out into the promised land and he's brought us to this desert to die and now we're stuck between the water and the Egyptian army. What are we going to do? But look. Look. Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? Do you not see what God is doing? God is doing a new thing. Forget the former things, what you knew, what you thought was possible. God is doing a new thing in this place. God will make a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. There had been a sea there before. There had been a sea. This immovable, unavoidable blanket of water all across the entire horizon as far as the eye could see. But in that very place, it says, the Israelites crossed, they went through the sea on dry ground. On dry ground. There was a wall of water to their right, a wall of water to their left, but they crossed through on this narrow path of dry ground. How many of you feel walled in by water? You see, to the right there's water, to the left there's water. <coughs> You see it, you can hear it, you can even feel it. Maybe there are even drops of water spraying you as you walk by. You might get a little wet. But our God will provide dry ground for you to pass through, no matter how much the water may be on every side. 
We do not believe in a different God from Moses. Do we believe in a different God than the God of the Bible, the God of Moses, the God of Isaiah? This is the same God, the same unchanging God that pulled Joseph out of that cistern, as we saw three weeks ago, that delivered Jonah from the belly of the whale, that brought down fire on Elijah's offering on Mount Carmel, that made the sun stand still for Joshua. It stood still in the sky just for Joshua and the Israelites. This is the same God that blinded Paul and then gave his sight back to him on the road to Damascus. The same God that took 11 disciples that were cowering in fear, shaking, trembling, afraid to die, and sent them out into the world to boldly proclaim the gospel to every corner of the earth. It is that same God. So don't tell that God there is no room to move. Do not tell that God there is no space for him to act. Because he will make room. He will make space. Even the animals stop and praise God, Isaiah says, for they know that God will provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. Many times we think of God, his provision, and his miracles as transactional or equational, meaning X plus Y equals Z. If you match that formula, then God can work. That God can make miracles happen, but only in ways that, that we can figure out, that we can estimate within the boundaries of what we can see and perceive and understand. So we ask God, God, make a miracle happen, but do it in this way. Do it inside this little, this little field that I have made, this small tree, right? God, work in here. But God is a bigger God than that. We cannot see the dry ground before it is there. How can we see dry ground when it is still covered in water? It wasn't there before, but it will be when God moves. How many of the Israelites could see that dry ground? Moses included, not even Moses could see this dry ground. He could not see it there. But God made a way that was not there just a second before. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Now it springs up. Not later. But now it springs up. We can see it because it's happening. We cannot see it before it happens. Yesterday, our pastor Emeritus spoke at the early morning service, and it was such a blessed time. Uh, I have to tell you, you know, um, waking up at you know 4:45 a.m. to come to service. But when you feel the spirit move, it's such a blessing. And I honestly, honestly. Not even joking. I feel bad for anyone that missed yesterday's service. So if you missed yesterday's Saturday service, you can come. This coming Saturday, there's another chance, right? Uh, we sit on the second floor, right in the middle. We have the best seat in the entire, we have the best seat. But truly, it was a special time. It was a blessed time. And our pastor emeritus, he spoke about Daniel, how Daniel lived in a foreign land all by himself. He had no help. He had no support, he had no family, no friends. He was all by himself in this foreign land, but he depended on God for his salvation. God made this narrow sliver of a path of dry ground for Daniel to pass through. When he was thrown into the lion's den, when he was thrown into the den with these lions, these vicious lions with their claws and their teeth, who could see a way out of that situation? But God protected him and kept him safe. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown into the fire, this furnace that had been made multiple times hotter than it normally was, and the king ordered them to be thrown into that fire, who could possibly guess a way for them to survive that heat, to survive that smoke, 
But God made a way where there seemed to be no way. God made dry ground where once there was water. And God made water where once there was dry ground. That is the God that we serve even today. As we were visiting Calvary Temple, you know, we noticed a lot of similarities. It kept, it kept coming up over and over again. We're like, oh, this is weird. We noticed so many similarities between Calvary Temple and our church. And more than that, we noticed a lot of similarities between their senior pastor, their founding pastor, Satish Kumar, and our pastor emeritus. It was almost like he was an Indian replica of our our pastor emeritus. And, well, the first thing is he lives at church, right? He loves being at church more than anywhere else in the world. Why would you go anywhere else? You have to be at church. He has this superhuman work ethic. I could see in his, his Piso's face, it was difficult to keep up with him. Right? But he has this superhuman work ethic, but also this spiritual spirituality, spiritual hunger that he had. Not just hungry for work, but also hungry for the Holy Spirit. He loves having worship. The more worships, the better, right? The more services, the better. And it can be, you know, long, it can go long, but we, he loves spending time in worship because this is a time for the congregation to come together in Christ. And he even bragged to us. He said, our church has 12 gates, just like Jerusalem. 12 gates, just like Jerusalem, our sanctuary. And our, our senior pastor said, you really are my dad. You really are my father. And we were originally planning, you know, you saw the pictures of the Youth Fest and the third anniversary service. We were planning to fly to Nambur from Hyderabad. It's only about a 45 minute flight. Should have been easy. But at the very last minute, he said, hey, why don't we drive? And so all of us, our team, his team, we all got into cars. Uh, I felt bad, some of his pizzas, there were like seven of them in one small car. But we all piled into these cars and we drove six hours to go to Nambur. And once we got there, he showed us all of the animals and the plants, the greenery. And he even had a small farm next to the church there. And we found out that this town was the hometown of his parents, way out in the countryside. This was his old country home. And that's when we realized, oh, we are in Andong right now. That is where we are. We're in Andong. And there were just so many similarities, funny similarities that we found. But the main one that I want to highlight is this. When we got to the main church, the main church, as I mentioned, is in Hyderabad. And Hyderabad isn't really what we expected. Not that you know, we were looking down on India, but New Delhi was sort of, I, we had higher expectations, actually. And New Delhi was not so nice. But when we got to Hyderabad, it was so nice there. The airport, the roads, all the buildings there, everything was just so sparkling and brand new. And that's because Hyderabad is also called high-tech city, high-tech city. So it's the Silicon Valley of India. So a lot of multinational corporations are headquartered in Hyderabad. So Microsoft, Google, IBM, GE, all these big companies have their main office building there in that city. And it's not just these tech firms, but I saw a lot of financial firms, pharmaceutical firms, manufacturing companies, all these different companies. There was so much concentration in that one small city and they all had these high-rise office buildings. And if you change the language on the signs to Korean, you know, you would think you're in Samsung That's what it felt like, right? Everything was brand new, glass and steel and wide streets, you know, perfectly paved sidewalks. And as we drove to the church from our hotel, uh, we got the authentic Indian experience of traffic, right? There were cars and scooters and bikes everywhere, but the roads themselves were very, very nice. You know, very wide, very well paved, you know, I come from 
a place with very bad roads, so you know, I'm a little sensitive to this. The roads were there were so nice. And as we approached the church, as we were arriving, I saw that there was a metro, metro station right outside the church, right at the entrance to the church campus. And there were also several bus stops, all stopping right there at the entrance to the church. And I saw all of this, and I thought, no wonder. No wonder this church grew. I mean, look at this location. It's perfect. It's beautiful. Look at all this concentrated right in this little area to help this church grow. They picked the perfect location, didn't they? You can say yes, but you can also say no. Because I found out that Reverend Kumar, he did pick that location. He felt that God gave him that location. But he picked it when everyone told him not to go there. So everyone told him, move out of the city, go find a nice large piece of land, you know, just outside the city in the suburbs, and build this beautiful, huge church. But he thought, no, I have to stay in the city where the people are. This is where God is calling me to be. And so he built that church there. He started the church there. And everyone told him that he was crazy, but he knew that's where God called him to be. And he told me that when he first planted the church there in Hyderabad, there were no paved roads. There were no paved roads there. None of these buildings, the shining steel and glass skyscrapers, not a single one was in Hyderabad when he started this church. None of these companies, these international companies, not a single one was in that city when he started that church. The metro station that we saw had not been built had not even been planned. No one even knew it was coming. And he joked to us that even if he took a million US dollars to the governor of the state, they would not have built that metro station for him. But by God's grace, that metro station, he said it appeared. They didn't pay a single rupee for that metro station to be built, but by God's grace, the metro station just appeared. Those bus stops just <coughs> appeared. They just received word, he said, that they're building another metro station, another uh, train line, actually. So a new line is going to come and also stop right in front of this church. So now the church is going to be open to even more re residents of their city. And I thought to myself, wow, why can't we get a new train station here? Right? Is that a bad word? No. Uh, the line number 10, right? Line number 10. It has to be blue. You know, sound blue, right? Why can't we get a new subway station? It truly, truly is possible. Why not? Because if our God moves, what can't happen? What can't we get? What can't God open for us? You know, I have the privilege to <clears throat> host the international visitors, uh, the dignitaries that come and visit our church. And many of them, they feel the same way. They have the same reaction when they see our church. Right? They see all these things around our church. They see the Bohusan, the five line, stopping just meters away from our church. Not one, but we have two stations right next to our church. Right? They see all the buses that come here. They see this huge highway that stops right outside our church. They see all the high-rise apartments, luxury buildings, all the shops, all the restaurants. I mean, think about how nice our area is, right? Have you thought about how nice this area really is? There's a whole plus. Home Plus, I love that Home Plus. You know, I didn't even realize how blessed I was, but my cousin, uh, one of my other cousins, visited from far away. And he said, you have a Home Plus in front of your house. Right in front of your house. What a blessing. But a lot of visitors, they come and they see all of this, and they say, oh, that makes sense. No wonder. No wonder Myeongsung grew the way that it did, because all of this was already here. All of this helped pave the way for your church. But that's not the truth. 
And I have to admit, I felt that same way when I first arrived, but I learned, and many of our longtime members here already know, that this is not the case. I was shocked, I was literally shocked to hear that the land in front of our Bethlehem sanctuary, right, the old uh, main worship hall, it used to be just a grass field, just hills, right? And I heard when it rained that people's shoes would get all muddy and they would bring in that mud from outside. And I wonder, maybe that's why we take off our shoes to come up, right, on the stage here, because of the mud, right? This corner of Kangdonggu had nothing, right? When this church was started here, this had nothing. There was no subway, there was no highway. There were no apartment buildings, these luxury apartment buildings, right? No Solbenyu or Lotte Castle, right? Sky Castle. None of, none of that was here. None of that was here. All it had was this little church, a little church called Myeongsong, the light of Myeongdong, right? I mean, even the name of the church, it, you know, who could have imagined that it would become a worldwide church? It was the light of just this small neighborhood called Myeongdong. But this small church had a big dream. And more importantly than a big dream, it had a big God. It had a truly big God, a God who makes space, a God who makes room, a God who moves and acts, even when we cannot see it. So yes, I stress to these visitor, visitors as much as possible, yes, we are in the perfect location, because this is where God has put us. But none of this was here before. All of this came afterwards when we were faithful to the mission that God had given us. When we were faithful and devoted to the place that God had put us, that is when all of that blessing came around us, not before. And I believe, I truly, truly believe, whether here in Myeongdong or over there in Hyderabad, that it wasn't the development of the surrounding area that blessed the church, right? You could say, well, yeah, okay, the, all that stuff wasn't there, but because it came, the church was blessed. But I wanna make a counterpoint counter argument and say no all of that came because of the church this community was blessed because of the church any community with a church will be blessed it was the church that blessed the surrounding area as we saw in the case of Joseph when the people of God are blessed those around them are blessed when the people of God are blessed all those around them are blessed. And we like to think of that as applying to our family and our friends, those that we you know, really care about, that we know by name. But it goes beyond even that, because our God is bigger than just that small circle. When the people of God are blessed, everyone around them is blessed. When the people of God are blessed, the surrounding community is blessed, the city is blessed. The country is blessed. The continent is blessed. The entire world is blessed. I don't know if the blessing goes out into space, but I imagine that it will. Everywhere around us, when people of faith are blessed, those around are blessed. So look and see, because God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. Look and see. Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? We can trust that what God is doing is good. Amen. I want to close our message for today with the church's theme verse for the year 2020. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for our good. In all things, God works for our good. This new thing that he is doing, it is for our good. Because we are those who love him. We have been called according to his purpose. So he is working for our good. We can trust in that. We can believe in that. God is making a new way. 
God is doing a new thing. God is casting a new vision. And God is doing it for us. For the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Let us pray together.